Hi guys, it's Brian here, and I received a comment from my TXRX duplexer tuning video from Bob Ruskowski, W5EVH, and he had a very good question. He said, why use a return loss bridge when you're tuning the pass of the cavities? So I thought that was a good enough question that we should do a video about the return loss bridge and why it's used, uh, why it's so helpful when tuning a cavity. So I have here... Um, my Amtronics SW1200N return loss bridge and we're going to use this in a minute here and do a comparison between tuning uh, directly with a signal generator and a spectrum analyzer and also using the return loss bridge and compare the uh, results that we get. So first of all I'd like to talk just a little bit about what a return loss bridge is. This is a directional coupler which means that the signal comes in and it goes in one direction only and then when the signal comes back it goes in a different direction. So here we have the input port and the signal generator is inserted here. It goes to this port which is the device under test which in this case is the cavity and then the cavity reflects back some of the signal but because this is a one-way junction here it can't go back toward the signal generator so instead it's directed in this direction toward the output port so the signal comes in here, goes to your device under test, the reflected power then comes back and goes to the output port. Okay, so the question was, why not just uh, connect up the duplexer to the RF generator and the spectrum analyzer and just tune it using the measuring the pass loss into the spectrum analyzer. So here's a picture of that setup. I have the uh, generator output going into the cavity and the output of the cavity going into the spectrum analyzer. So there's a spectrum analyzer view and the top line is uh, normalized to 0 dB. You can look at my other videos if you want to check out how to do that. And we're looking at a center frequency of 145 which I've already tuned this cavity to. And it shows a 0.42 dB loss which is good. Um, this is a 2 megahertz span so it's one megahertz either way of center. So you can see how far we go 600, 800 kilohertz to the left uh, before the signal starts to drop off. Uh, so it's not really very useful for tuning. You don't have much resolution there to tune it with. Uh, going in the other direction, you're coming into the reject curve, and you can see it plus 600 kilohertz you have the uh, reject notch so that's not really very useful either to tune so there's, there's your big problem with using the uh, pass method of tuning without a return loss bridge you really don't have much resolution um, to get your tuning and you can tune that thing just about anywhere in that range and then retune the notch and it'll look more or less right on this screen it'll look the same way but when we're going to look at the return loss bridge, we're looking at the VSWR, or the reflected power, at your operating frequency, and you'll find that that will be way off. You'll have a, a very high SWR into your cavity, which won't really promote good operation of your uh, transmitter or power amp in your transmitter. Okay, so here's our same setup using uh, return loss, and you can see that I have the generator going into the return loss bridge, and the output of the return loss bridge going to the spectrum analyzer, and then the device under test port on the return loss bridge is going to the input of the cavity, and then I have a 50 ohm load on the other port of the cavity. So you can see we have a much sharper display. This is again, I didn't change any settings really on the spectrum analyzer. I just renormalized it to accommodate the return loss bridge. <clears throat> so you see that I have uh, a much sharper tuning picture here for the pass. So I can adjust the fine tuning and you can see the uh, return loss curve moving up and down. So we're just going to uh, set that for the minimum return loss, which means that it's the best SWR or tuned to that frequency, the 145 megahertz center frequency. 
and you see I have uh, 21.7 dB of return loss. So you can see by doing it this way you get a much more accurate picture of where your pass frequency is tuned and you'll also will, will result uh, this will also result in a much better uh, in operation of your transmitter and, and uh, PA. So that's it. Any questions you have, please uh, write in the comments and uh, try to do my best to answer them for you. All of the problems covered in my videos can be downloaded at accountingworkbook.com. If you go to the website, click the PDF link, you can download a copy of the workbook for yourself. Also on the website, you'll find links to all of my accounting videos, not just the ones I've uploaded to YouTube. I've uploaded over a hundred extra videos on this website that you can't find on YouTube. So I do hope you'll check out accountingworkbook.com. All right, let's begin our problem. All right, let's examine problem 8-4a. It has us disposing of a depreciable asset at a gain or a loss. So we're going to buy an asset, we're going to use it for some time, and then we're going to sell it, and the company's either going to make a gain or a loss on the sale. So let's have a look. Bill's Towing purchased a new tow truck on April 1st, 2017 for $110,000 cash. Okay, so let's do this journal entry. Let's do the journal entries kind of as we see them. So the first one... Well, I guess I can leave it up here. Uh, April 1st, 2017. So, and this is our answer to part A. I, I've kind of scanned the question ahead here. Uh, April 1st, 2017. We bought a new tow truck for 110 grand cash. So debit, we'll just call it truck. I mean, we could say tow truck, but that's fine. Credit cash, 110K. Okay, so there's journal entry A in the bed. Company expects to keep the truck for 10 years, after which time it plans to sell it for 20 grand. Okay, so let's see, 110,000 is our cost. Our residual value is 20. So our depreciable cost is 90. Again, cost, residual value, depreciable cost is 90 and we're going to depreciate that 90 it's straight line the company's account use wishes to use straight line so we're going to do that over 10 years so that's at a rate of nine thousand dollars per year okay so we've got our amortization rate or our depreciation rate uh, let's see what happens april 1st uh, bill's towing has a fiscal year end of august 31st so it says the second part says uh, record the required year-end adjustments. So the required year-end adjustment, the adjustment to get us up to August 31st, B, is how many months? Well, April, May, June, July, August. It's five months. So we said it was 9,000 bucks in depreciation for a year. We're only interested in five twelfths of a year. Nine thousand times five twelfths is thirty-seven fifty. So we debit depreciation expense, and we credit accumulated depreciation on our truck. And this is like the journal entry that we learned way back in chapter three. Debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation truck. So at the end of our fiscal year, our truck is worth 110 grand minus 3750. And, and that's just our truck minus the accumulated depreciation. That's 106,250. That's our truck's net book value that will show on our fiscal year end financial statements. C. On November 30th, Bill sells the truck. Record depreciation up to the date. So let's see, it's August now. So August, September, October, November. It's three months after that. So uh, um, November 30th, 2017, we have an additional three months of amortization. It was 9,000 for a year. We're doing three twelfths of a year. Twenty-two fifty in depreciation. So, 
I debit depreciation expense. We always have to depreciate an asset up to the date of the sale. And so that's what we're doing here. 2250. We credit accumulated depreciation on our truck for 2250. We're just depreciating this up to the date of the sale. So just out of curiosity, what's my truck's net book value on the date of the sale? Well, again, the truck's cost was 110. Oops, didn't want to underline there. Uh, the amount of depreciation so far has been 3750 and 2250. The amount of the depreciation so far has been $6,000, and that's just 3750 plus 2250. That's the accumulated depreciation. So again, truck minus accumulated depreciation equals truck net. Our truck's net book value is 104,000. Okay. So, so far up to here, nothing really new. I mean, a couple of partial year amortization entries, but nothing crazy new. Now something new. Assume, uh, so part D, I. We'll look at I, I in a second. Uh, assume Bill sold the truck for 106 grand cash. Record the journal entry for the sale. Okay, so we get paid $106,000 for this truck. Debit cash. 106. We got to get rid of the truck. The truck is on our books for $110,000. There's the truck sitting on our books. We don't have any other debits or debits or credits to truck. We also have to get rid of the accumulated depreciation on the truck and the total accumulated depreciation is 3750 and 2250 It's $6,000. So I get rid of the AD truck for six thousand dollars now i've got to say to myself well i'm missing a number here right i've got 112,000 in debits just 106 plus six i got 110 in credits i'm missing a two thousand dollar credit that difference and and it should make some sense we got paid hundred six thousand dollars cash for a truck that's on our books for 104 we got paid more than what we thought the truck was worth so i'm going to ask you is this a gain or is this a loss and the answer is, this is a gain. We got paid more than the truck was worth on the books. Uh, therefore, this is a gain on sale. And that's the account we, we credit. Credit gain on sale of truck. So that's our journal entry. And it's also a November 30th, 2017 entry for the sale of the truck. Again, we got paid 106 for an asset that we thought was worth 104. The journal entry works. We debit cash. We get rid of the truck and the accumulated depreciation related to the truck. And the difference goes to gain or loss. Let's look at part II of the question. Part two, I guess, would be a cooler way to say that. Um, we get paid just 85,000. So we have the same truck worth 104, but rather than getting 106 for the 104 asset, we only get 85,000. I, I think you can all project this is going to be a loss situation. We got paid less than what the truck was worth on our books. November 30th, 2017, debit cash, this time just for $85,000. We got to get rid of the truck, so we credit truck for 110. We got to get rid of any accumulated depreciation on the truck, so debit AD truck for uh, six. Thousand dollars, and then I look at this journal entry, and I'm I'm imbalanced again. I have 91 grand in debits. I have on 10 in credits. I'm off by 19,000 in debits. I debit loss on sale. So I just want to compare the two entries. They're almost identical entries. The difference is the cash and the gain or loss. This one, when I get paid more, it's a it's a gain. So. Why do I credit gains and debit losses? Well, gains are revenues. When we prepare our financial statements, we're listing all of our revenues and expenses. This would be listed as an other revenue. Other revenues and expenses. This is an other revenue when I have a gain. It's an other expense when I have a loss on sale. So very important concept. One, I test every single test when I'm giving exams and one, your prof probably will uh, want you to examine pretty closely and will want you to understand. So again, ABC, doesn't matter which, you know, how much money we're getting, this is what you'd have to do. Buy the asset, depreciate it right up till the date of the sale. 
Then when we sell it, we have to determine was there a gain or a loss and how much was that gain or loss. So I hope this has been clear to you. There's one more problem that explores this, uh, problem 8-4B that we'll be doing, uh, well, you can click on anytime. All right, talk to you soon.